Harvisklin family, welcome. It is my joy and privilege to be with you uh, this Sunday, even via recording and virtual. My name is Seth Stafford, um, and I am on staff at the Summit Church. I apprentice under our adult discipleship pastor, and I've been there for the past two years, and it's been a privilege and a blessing to be there, to learn, to grow. Uh, Colin and I were roommates uh, when we first moved here in 2018 to seminary, and so uh, it was it was honestly a, a privilege and uh, and was a great joy that he asked me if I could share with uh, with you uh, with you all the church family uh, even even though I had to record myself I was super excited to see you all in person. Uh, however, I know the times and circumstances are still weird and still changing so. Uh, yeah, just just privileged to be able to do this uh, anyway. So uh, pray that as we open God's word together and go through it, that He would bless us. So uh, before we get started, we'd love to just pray for us, and uh, then we'll dive in. So, Father God, thank you so much for being a gracious and loving God. Thank you for putting us here on this earth, God. Thank you for your Son Jesus, God, and giving us hope and redemption through Him. Uh, may the words that be spoken. Uh, Lord, not be by me, uh, but through your Spirit. Uh, Lord, hide me behind your cross. Make less of me, more of you, and open our eyes and ears to understand your word. I see things in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so before we dive into Scripture, uh, we're going to be in the book of Daniel. So if you have a copy of God's word, you can go ahead and turn there to the book of Daniel. Uh, while you're turning there, uh, I want to ask you this question. Uh, I mentioned the book of Daniel. If anybody else mentions the book of Daniel, uh, what comes to your mind? What's the first thing that pops into your mind about Daniel? Now, if I was in person, I'm sure I would get a lot of smiles, and I'm sure somebody would echo Daniel in the lion's den. And like, that's perfect. That's the best answer almost that anybody could give on the book of Daniel. Uh, maybe it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how God saved them from the fiery furnace. And these are all... Uh, if you grew up in, in, in church your whole life, even as a little boy or girl, these are uh, the big time uh, Sunday school children church stories that you grew up on. And, and if you're an unbeliever or you're here and you've never been to church or you're watching this and you never grew up in the church and honestly you've never heard the book of Daniel, don't know much about it, and you're kind of wondering what these stories uh, I'm mentioning are, that's okay. Um, uh, what we're going to see here in Daniel, I believe, is an even greater story than possibly Daniel in the lion's den or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego getting thrown into the fiery furnace and God saving them. Uh, what we're going to look at here is God himself, uh, him showing us through Daniel chapter 1, not only his faithfulness, but who he is as sovereign God and that he is in control despite Daniel and the people of Judah's circumstances. So, if you have a copy of God's Word, look with me in chapter 1. Uh, Daniel is a narrative, and so chapter 1, we're going to read all the way through it. Um, but what we're going to do is, instead of reading it all and then coming back, uh, we're just going to go through it together, and uh, I'll point out some key things. And then at the end, I want us to see something that's very interesting uh, I think, and that God has uh, his timely message for us in this season. So, if you have a copy of God's Word, you're in Daniel chapter 1. Uh, find verse 1 and read along with me, please. It says, In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon to the house of his God, and he put the vessels in the treasury of his God. Stop right here for a second, uh, and you're kind of wondering what is going on. Uh, there's a lot of uh, confusion, maybe. Um, you see that King Jehoiakim, uh, uh, the king of Judah, is given over uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, in Babylon, and you may ask, well, why is this so? Uh, we could dive into context for honestly probably 15 minutes, uh, but I'll try to keep it short. Essentially what has happened here is the people of Judah, God's children, have sinned and disobeyed, and God is handing them over out of the promised land that they were in into the enemy's hands, into exile essentially, into King Nebuchadnezzar, 
in the Babylon, Babylonian army. Um, if you go back, if you have time later, uh, you can read 2 Kings uh, 24 and 25. And that goes into a little uh, deeper context of what was happening, kind of some of the sins committed, uh, some of the things that God had promised, some of the things in Scripture that are there that kind of illuminate this text a little more. And you can even go further back uh, to Deuteronomy 28, right before the people enter into the promised land in Joshua 1. In Deuteronomy 28, what we find is uh, God giving Moses uh, some blessings and some curses for his people. Essentially, Deuteronomy 28, uh, 1 through 14, I believe it is, uh, God gives some blessings for his people if they obey in the promised land. And then 15, verses 15 through uh, 68, it is, uh, God gives, on the flip side of that, curses for disobedience if his people disobey him in the promised land. And verses 63, and go back and you can read it for yourself, very interesting. Verses 63 and 64 of Deuteronomy 28 uh, really explain what is happening here. God essentially says, uh, because of the disobedience of my people and the curse that comes about from that, uh, I will uh, scatter my people amongst the nations. The enemies will come in, will take over, and essentially they will become exiles and will not be in the promised land no more. And so, hence, Daniel 1 is kind of is where we're at in that story, in that promise, in that fulfillment, and it's an interesting uh, just how the Bible continues as one story. I know Colin told me that you guys have started a series, Christ and Covenant, and have been going through Genesis and just seeing uh, how the how the Bible is, yes, two testaments, but just one storyline uh, as a whole, uh, God's redemptive story. And so it's interesting seeing how even back in Deuteronomy, uh, a couple, num numerous books back before Daniel, uh, we see how God is issuing out uh, these curses and these blessings and how they're being fulfilled. And so that's what's going on here. Uh, but notice too, in, the verse, in verse 2, the second line, it says that God, along with some of the vessels from the house of God, he handed them over to King, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. And then Nebuchadnezzar, watch what he does. He carries them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and he puts the vessels in the treasury of his God. Now, what is, what is going on here? Why is this in Daniel 1? Well, it's interesting. If you grew up in the ancient Near East, in that time period, essentially what this means is when one nation comes and overtakes another nation's and they take their gods and place them in the temple of their own gods, what it's saying is our gods are better than your gods. Your god was not uh, able to protect you, to keep you from harm's way, from evil. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, essentially by taking some of the vessels from, uh, from the temple of God, uh, they, and placing them in the midst of his own gods is saying that the God of Israel was not even able to protect his own people. So essentially, the losers, uh, if the people were losers, their God was losers. That's what's going on here. If the people were losers, the gods were losers. And so that's what verse 2 kind of takes us into the story. Like, this is what's happened. This is honestly the, the, what disobedience did to the people of Judah. But another thing that's very interesting uh, that this tells us is that God will even go uh, to shaming him, his own self uh, in order to rescue his people. Or uh, God is, will go, was willing to shame his own self uh, in order that he may make aware to his people the danger that's ahead. And that danger is their sin and their disobedience. So that's what's happened in verse 1 and 2. Uh, pick back up with me in verses 3 and we'll continue on. It says, The king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction and in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend the king. Among them from the Judites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave the name Belshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, 
Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Verse 8, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch, yet he said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard, the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. So he agreed with them about this, and he tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. We'll stop right there again. Uh, There's a lot that's going on. Uh, So essentially, people are in exile, the people of Judah. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar issues this to his chief eunuch, Ashpenaz. He says, hey, he said, go get the finest young man without any physical defect, good looking, suitable for instruction and all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, capable of serving in the king's palace. All that's in verse 4. And like I said, if you go back to 2 Kings 24, 25, it even goes a little greater into detail and it says these are metalsmiths, these are people that are trained. Uh, I believe it even goes into the number that uh, that King Nebuchadnezzar issued and wanted, uh, which was a great number. And so Daniel and his friends uh, are a part of these people, the, um, the finest of the finest of, of Jude, uh, Judah's people, God's children. And so uh, as, as they are getting brought to the king, as they are getting trained up in the Chaldean language and literature, notice what verse 8 says. It says, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the, with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Daniel's faithfulness that he had towards God was greater than the circumstances that he was faith in, facing. Even in exile, even in the appearance of evil, and people trying to change your way of thinking, your philosophy, your wisdom, uh, trying to get you to serve in the king's army, the enemies who just overtaken you, Daniel was faithful. And I believe this is so. Uh, well, I'll say this. Why he, he, he didn't want the king's food uh, is, is a bigger issue, or not a bigger issue, I'll say, is a bigger debate. Uh, but honestly, it's something that we should not get uh, caught up on. Uh, I just believe it's a conviction that God had given Daniel, and Daniel was faithful to that conviction that God had given him. So Daniel said, I would determine not to defile myself with the king's food because uh, my God is faithful, and so I want to be faithful to him. And so here's something uh, very interesting that we see in, in this verse right here is that they might have changed Daniel's name in verses, uh, verse 7, they might have changed Daniel's uh, literature. They might have started changing Daniel's language to the Chaldean language. But they could not change Daniel's heart. That's what verse 8 shows us, is that they could change all these other things about Daniel, but they couldn't change Daniel's heart. So it's easy, it's easy for us even to give in to the evil ways of this world, to just bow down to what's wrong and what's evil of this world when things are going wrong. It would have been easy for Daniel and even his friends to bow down, to fall down, to let them change not only his ways and his outward appearance, but even his own heart. It's easy to do that, those things, but Daniel knew. Daniel knew that his God was faithful, and so he remains faithful to that. So I want to ask you two questions in light of that. Are you being faithful to God even in the midst of his silent working? Though you may not see God working, which is up believe what Daniel probably experienced here. I mean, they're exiled. They just, they're captive. They just got overthrown by the people of Babylon. And now he's being uh, trained and taken up to the king's court to fight for his army to learn uh, the Babylonian Chaldean way. I mean, things are not looking good. So I imagine Daniel is like, where are you, God? In the midst of the silent working that God is doing, though, are you faithful? If you can't see God, do you trust God? Because he's faithful. Second question, 
Is God calling on you to make a stand of faith in the midst of our constantly changing culture? Is God calling on you to take a stand of faith in the midst of our constantly changing culture? And we see this day by day. Our culture changes and it changes and it just seems like it falls wayward, wayward to the world and to the evil ways, wicked ways. Will you remain faithful to God because he is faithful to you? So Daniel remained faithful here, even in a small thing, something as small as declining the king's food, such as uh, not drinking the wine that the king wanted him uh, to drink. Daniel remained faithful in these small things so that God could allow him and that he would be able to be faithful in the big things, such as being in the lion's den. We all sometimes want to face and be faithful and face these lion den situations and have that kind of faith, which is not wrong, but let me tell you something. If we're not faithful in even the small things, there's no way we're going to be able to be faithful in the big things that God gives us. So be faithful in the small things. Have the, be faithful in, in what God has ordered and commanded from us in Scripture. Know your Bible well. If you want to be faithful to God, you have to know His Word well. You can't be faithful if you don't know what God has said. So know what God has said, what God has commanded, what God has taught us, and be faithful to that. Moving on from here, uh, we'll pick up in verse 17. Verse 17 says, God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. Now at the end of the time that the king had said to present them, the chief unit presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they began to attend the king, and every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and mediums in the entire kingdom. Daniel remained there until the first year. Of King Cyrus. So what do we see here in this last section? We see that Daniel and his friends started out as exiles, as captives, as slaves essentially, essentially in verses 1 through 7. Just overtaken by King Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army. Now we see in verses 17 through 21 that is Daniel and his friends who are found better than all the magicians and all the mediums in the entire kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, kingdom. So why is this? Why did God allow this? Essentially, it's so that uh, God would say, I'm in control. Though things may see, seem out of control, so though things may in spite of our appearance, seem difficult and hard and evil. God is saying, I am in control. So here's the key takeaway I want us to see from this whole chapter. Maybe you picked it up in the few verses, in the three verses I'm about to share with you, but we can get caught up in uh, this chapter. We can, it's so easy to get caught up in uh, the surface level actions of human characters like Daniel and his friends. But this whole chapter, I believe, primarily intends to teach us not about Daniel, not even essentially about his faithfulness or his wisdom or his knowledge. This whole chapter primarily intends to teach us about God himself. Look at verse 2 with me. It says, The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to King Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord handed. The Lord gave, if you want to say it was the Lord's doing. It wasn't by mere accident that the people of God stumbled into King Nebuchadnezzar and his army. The Lord handed them over. He gave King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him. Therefore, God is in control. Look at verse 9. God granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. There's a word essentially again. God granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. God gave Daniel kindness and compassion with the chief eunuch. It's God who's doing the work. God may be 
silent in our minds, but God is still at work. Third verse, verse 17. God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. So who appointed Daniel and his friends to go from the slave exile captives that they were to having the knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom so that King Nebuchadnezzar would find them ten times better than anybody else in his entire kingdom. It was God. God gave them the faithfulness. God gave them the knowledge. God gave them the understanding. God gave them the position uh, to bring about his name, to bring about his goodness. Essentially, to bring about the promises, the hopes, the plans that God is willing to fulfill and has fulfilled. So God gave, verses 2. God gave, verses 9. God gave, verses 17. So I don't believe this chapter is essentially trying to tell us about Daniel. As much as we may want to believe it, and there's some good things that we can take away from Daniel's faithfulness, and I think we should. But I think this chapter shows us about God in control. In spite of the circumstances, in spite of what Daniel and his friends were looking at, like what they were in, almost one of the worst circumstances you can be in, a slave in exile, it was God who was making provision. It was God who was giving Daniel faithfulness, who was giving uh, him uh, compassion and kindness with a chief eunuch. I mean, why would someone of Ashpenaz's status, the chief eunuch of King Nebuchadnezzar, have compassion and kindness or someone like uh, Daniel and his friends. It's only because of God, the grace of God. God is given. God is given. The irony of this whole story, too, the irony of this whole story is that the same people of God, and I mentioned this earlier, started out as captives, thrown into exile, are now some of the same ones found delightful in the eyes of King Nebuchadnezzar and his courts. Daniel, a young boy, King Nebuchadnezzar had brought into his kingdom, had brought into his army for the advancement of his ways, of his uh, kingdom, is now being used by God for the advancement of God's kingdom through the engagement of the Babylonian courts. So there's another story, though, another story we came from even looking at this story that's even more ironic than Daniel and God's faithfulness. It's the story of humankind. Maybe you remember in Genesis 3, if y'all looked at that, but man's uh, fall from creation. God created this perfect world. Man's fall. Therefore, there's this disconnect between God. Yet, it's amazing how we see it's God still in control. He has a plan uh, of redemption, the God's redemptive story. It starts there in Genesis 3, and it makes a beeline to Matthew 1. And we find in Matthew 1 a little baby. And this little baby's name is Jesus Christ. And what this is, is Jesus Christ, even like God here, willing to shame his own self by coming, taking on human form, human likeness. Experienced all the evil that we face in this world. Endured life endured the cross, took punishment, our shame, our guilt, our sin, took it all upon himself, died, was buried, and three days later rose again so that we may have faith in him and get to partake in his righteousness so that we may uh, obtain the kingdom of God. The irony in that story that essentially we become the people who are least deserving of being in the, in the courts of God, being able to commune with God, to be able to partake in the righteousness of God. This is who Jesus is. John 3.16, you know this verse. It says, God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, will have eternal life. It's God in control. God is given. He's sovereign. He's good. Philippians 2, 7. Jesus. Jesus emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant and by taking on the likeness of humanity. 
And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, the ultimate portrayal, betrayal of God shaming himself in order to save those whom he loves most. The irony of that story. Maybe you're here, though, and you have a relationship with Jesus. There's one thing I want to implore you with. I want to give you uh, to take home with. It's a sense of hope. And that's in verse 21 of Daniel uh, chapter 1, the last verse. It says, Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. What does this mean? It means Daniel, God allowed his faithful goodness and him being in control, allowed Daniel to remain there even past King Nebuchadnezzar. When King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian people thought that they were in control, no, it was God who was in control the whole time. Therefore, the people of Israel reading this would have had hope. They would have had hope that God's going to redeem his people. He's going to get us out of this exile and back into the promised land. For Christians, for us believers, this is hope. This is confidence that Jesus has essentially defeated death. He's defeated Satan, hell, evil, the grave. So that one day, at the trumpet's blast, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And with this hope and this confidence that Jesus being victorious is that we don't have to fight for victory. Listen, brothers and sisters, we get to fight from victory. Jesus has done it all. He's the victor for us. We get to partake in that. We get to fight from that. And we get to be faithful to him. So the story of Daniel... Is a, is, is a story about who God is himself. Daniel teaches us in Daniel 1 about God being in control. He's an all-powerful and all-sovereign God who in spite of our appearance of circumstances is in control. So my prayer is that as, as you and I, believers in the faith, living as exiles essentially in this world, this world is not our home, that you and I would be comforted by who God is in the story of Daniel 1. He's in control. He places us where he wills and he calls us to be faithful. And he gives us a hope for the future to endure. Praise be to God for this.